Hi, and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. We are doing a massive problem today. So we are doing a big stoichiometry problem, um, which has some extra parts as well. We're going to do all the parts as we can. The last video, we did um, the empirical and molecular formula. So let's put a little check mark by that one, because we're done with number one. Woo! Love it. All right, so number two, we need to do. OK, so number two. Um, if 15 grams of ascorbic acid are now reacted in a combustion reaction, calculate the theoretical yield of each product. Indeed, with number two, we're doing stoichiometry, just in case you were wondering. How do I know that it's a stoichiometry problem? Because I'm given an amount of one thing, ascorbic acid, and I'm asked to calculate products, which if I'm reacting the ascorbic acid, it's a reactant, not a product. So in order to do this, any time you have stoichiometry, you have to have a balanced chemical reaction. And the key phrase here that I have is that it was reacted in a combustion reaction. So that's going to tell me what kind of reaction I'm doing. All right, so let's take ascorbic acid. When we take ascorbic acid, we have to take the molecular formula. That's how ascorbic acid comes. It's a molecule that has six C's, H, eight H's in terms of atoms, six C atoms, eight H atoms, and six oxygen atoms somehow combined together, OK? So what we know from a combustion reaction is you take some kind of hydrocarbon, which is what I got right there, and I react it with oxygen. And I form carbon dioxide and water. So that's what you generally have to know. You just have to know that off the top of your head. You're going to change this piece, but these pieces never change. Having said that, I now need to balance that. All right, so I have six C's on this side. That means I need six C's on this side. I have eight H's on this side. That means I better have eight H's on this side as well. So four times two is eight. And now I need to count the, uh, the total number of O's. I have 12 O's from CO2 and four O's from H2O, which makes 16 O's. Six of those O's are taken up by this lovely ascorbic acid. So 16 minus 6 is 10, which means I need 5 times 2 right there. All right, fantastic. That's awesome. Balanced chemical equation, first thing that I got to do. All right, now I know I have 15 grams of ascorbic acid, right? And in order to do this, I need to calculate the theoretical yield of each product. In terms of the theoretical yield of each product, I need to pick one of these to begin with, because I can only do stoichiometry one at a time. So let's do CO2 first, since I wrote it down first. OK, to do this, I'm going to take the grams of the reactant that I'm given. I'm going to divide by the molar mass. Of that reactant, which was given. Isn't that awesome? Love it. And then that gets me into moles. Moles are very important because the ratios, right, the balanced chemical equation has these coefficients in front. That's what these numbers of each reactant and product mean. And those numbers are in moles. So that's why I'm getting into moles first. OK? So my ratio, now I can set up a ratio between ascorbic acid and carbon dioxide. And I see every time I use one mole of ascorbic acid, I make six moles of carbon dioxide. And I'm going to write the ascorbic acid down here because it's taking a lot of room. right? And now, if I wanted this in moles, I'd be done. Um, I probably didn't because the theoretical yield is almost always in grams. Why is it almost always in grams in terms of at least beginning stoichiometry that we do. The reason why is because the scale, when we're comparing an actual yield to a theoretical yield, we're really measuring something on a scale for the actual yield. And that's in grams. So that's why we usually do these in grams. I would need the molar mass of carbon dioxide. There we go. I'm running out of room here, so this is a little bit. How did I get the molar mass of carbon dioxide? I just knew it. <laughs> but if you don't just know it, what you would do is you would calculate, uh, you would look at the periodic table for C, 
figure out that the molar mass of C is 12.01, the molar mass of O is 16, multiply 12.01 times 1 because there's 1 C, multiply 16 times 2 because there's 2 O's, add them together, 44.01 is the one you, uh, number you should get. And if I calculate this out, I get 15 divided by 176.14 times 6 times 44.01. 22.49 grams of CO2. Now what's really interesting here is that I just realized something. I realized that this part of the problem asked for the mass of excess reactant. Well, you can't calculate that if you did what we just assumed, right? So what we had here is we had 15 grams only of one of the reactants. If you only have 15 gr an amount of one of the reactants, you assume the other one is in excess so much that we don't care. So you, there's no way to calculate the mass of that. The only way I could go on to this next step of calculating the mass of the excess reactant is if we change this a little bit and we say if 15 grams of ascorbic acid and oxygen mm, are reacted in a combustion reaction, then calculate the theoretical yield of each product. If we make this one little change, then we suddenly have two amounts of two reactants. And we can still keep this. We can still say, okay, that one works just lovely. That would be great if I was only given one amount. But if I'm giving, given two amounts, of two reactants, and this would be of the oxygen as well, 15 grams of oxygen, then suddenly I have a limiting reactants problem. And one of those will be limiting and the other one will be excess. Kind of an interesting turn in terms of this. So let's go ahead and do, let's go ahead and do a limiting reactants problem here. Let's assume that I had 15 grams of each of these, right? And I had 15 grams of oxygen as well. If I have 15 grams of oxygen, I'm going to go through the exact same process, but I have to find CO2 again to be able to compare the two numbers that I get. How did I get oxygen's molar mass? I took 16 times 2. That was how I did that. And 6 moles of CO2. Here, the ratio is a little bit different because I want to cancel out O2. So every time I make six moles of CO2, I'm actually using five moles of O2. And then this part is the same. 44.01 grams of CO2 per one mole of CO2. Mm. So here I get 15 divided by 32 times 6 times 44.01 divided by 5. Ooh, 24.76 grams of CO2. Okay, now I can run a comparison here, right? So now that I have the exact same units of the exact same thing, I can compare what was made by the ascorbic acid versus what was made by the O2. Totally different kind of problem, really, but totally interesting in terms of what we tend to calculate more often. Limiting reactants are more the deal that we usually get in the lab, where we aren't given an amount of one and then just have the other in excess no matter what. We tend to have more than one amount. Okay, so now that I'm in this comparison place, I look at these two numbers. Which number do I pick? The smaller of the two. Woo, there it is. That one is now the theoretical yield of CO2. I can label lots now that I've picked that number. I can say that ascorbic acid is the limiting reactant. And O2 is now the excess reactant. And we'll be able to calculate how much excess there is. Okay, so even in my wildest dreams,
I could not make 24.76 grams of CO2 if I'm only given 15 grams of ascorbic acid. Okay. Having said that, now that I've made this comparison, I again act as if I was only given the 15 grams of ascorbic acid to calculate the mass of the H2O. So here we go. The theoretical yield of the H2O is perhaps a better way to say that. Mmm, much more interesting problem that we just created. Not that stoichiometry with an excess reactant isn't kind of interesting, or that this particular reaction might actually lend itself to that kind of deal, because combustion reactions are often done on a bench top, and therefore, if they're done in a bench top, then you are just reacting with whatever oxygen is in the air, and that's hard to quantify unless you're adding it in, bubbling it in. But we're going to go with this because I asked C. <laughs> that's where we are. All right, so there's the theoretical yield of CO2. All right, so let's do the theoretical yield of H2O. I'm going to again start with the 15 grams of ascorbic acid, and forgive me for combining these a little bit but I'm running out of room in my calculations here. All right, and again, I'm gonna divide by the molar mass. I got a squeaky marker. Seems to be my lot in life, actually. And now I know every time I react one mole of this lovely ascorbic acid in the balanced chemical equation, I make four moles of water. And last piece, molar mass of water. We'll hope that didn't go off the screen. 18.02 grams. Awesome. <laughs> it didn't go off the screen. I love it when that happens. Okay. Now, why did I set up this just as a reiteration? for those of you who are still a little confused about stoichiometry, why are we setting it up like this? I mean, yes, you can follow the process of you start with what you're given, you, you convert to moles, use the mole ratio, so on and so forth, but that's really an algorithm, right? The reason why we're doing this is because of this piece right here, this idea that the mole ratio is in moles. So everything we, have to, we do has to get into moles and get out of moles, right? And in order to get into moles, all that we're doing here is really dimensional analysis. All of these should cancel out. And I should have only grams of water left in the end as my unit on top. Let's go ahead and calculate that out. So 15 divided by 176.14. All right, 15, one, four, yep, sorry, I just was doing something real quick, right quick. All right, 6.13, or 6.14 grams of H2O. Awesome! Look at that. So, now I have the theoretical yield of H2O. I have the theoretical yield of CO2. I could totally do this. That's awesome. Next step is in the next video. So until then, I bid you adieu. Adios.